Okay, so we are on. This is what I will post to the, uh, the Canvas page. So very quickly, um, let me say that these meetings do not replace everything in the book. I, I just don't simply have time to go over every little minutia in the book. I focus on the sections that I think are most important and I distill that even more. So I tr what I try to do is I try to make complicated, I try to make complicated topics uh, simplified for you so that when you do read your book, you understand it better. And I draw lots of pictures to help you understand. So let's just start off with chapter one. I'm just gonna flip through this one really quickly because it's just an intro chapter. It just talks about the definition of anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the study of, of something structure and physiology is function. That's pretty easy. I'm sure most of you know that. And then there are some, and oh, by the way, um, form, anatomy, determines function, physiology. So usually we say form dictates function. And that's what your, your book calls the complementary uh, complementarity of structure and function is that form dictates function. And then there's subtopics of anatomy. I'm going to breeze through this because it's very simple. And I might just ask you one uh, multiple choice question on the quiz about this stuff because it's so simple and easy. There's different topics specifically in anatomy, not so many in physiology. Um, there's things like gross or macroscopic anatomy. That just means what we can see with the, with the unaided eye without a microscope. There's something called regional anatomy. Regional anatomy just refers to a, a region on the body. For example, there's whole um, subjects, courses in like head and neck anatomy and physiology. So if you're going to be a dentist or a dental hygienist, for example, you would take a course in head and neck A and P. That would be regional anatomy. Systemic anatomy is how really we are going to study A and P. That's just organ system by organ system. All A and P books that I've ever taught from are organized in, in this fashion, systemic anatomy. You just study one system at a time, except for this first unit, which is introduction. It's just a conglomeration of stuff. Surface anatomy refers to um, body surface landmarks, and that's dictated by the structure underneath. Um, and there's a whole section in at the end of chapter one about uh, regional terms, um, anatomical position, directional terms, and surface body landmarks. So figure 1.7, for example, in your textbook, it is a diagram about surface anatomy. <clears throat> and those names are often given for the structure uh, lying underneath it. For example, we call this the frontal part of the head right here, what you and I call the forehead. That's technically called the frontal region of the head. And the reason is because the bone underneath that is called the frontal bone. If I turned around and pointed to this part of my back, that's called the scapular region because the scapula bone is underneath that. So that's just an example of surface anatomy. Then there's microscopic anatomy. That just means things are so small we have to use a microscope, like cellular anatomy and tissues, which we will talk about later. And finally, developmental anatomy. That just refers to um, anatomical structures as the organism grows, either from embryology, which is a subset of developmental anatomy, all the way up through a fully developed, physically grown subject or organism. Topics of physiology, basically those just refer to the operation of a specific system, and that's how also we're gonna study this, like uh, neurophysiology, cardiophysiology. Let me just mute some microphones here so that we can all can hear. <clears throat> so I'm gonna move on now I'm still in chapter one. I know I'm going fast, and the reason is because I want to get through a lot of material. You can ask me anything at the end, don't worry. Um, so what section 1.2 just talks about the organization of, of the human body. And this is really easy as well. There's certain levels of organization, and we typically start with always the chemical level. It just goes, so I'm gonna I'm gonna name 
the levels of organization first and then briefly talk about each level. It goes chemical, cellular, tissue, organ, organ system, and organism. So the chemical level just refers to things like atoms making up molecules, for example, hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms make up the molecule of water. So this is all still in the chemical level. And then molecules make up organelles, which are little tiny structures inside of a cell. So that's all encompassed in the chemical level. The next level is the cellular level. And you need to put a star next to cellular level because that level is cells are the smallest units of all living things. So cells, we always say, are the building blocks of all living things. Next, there's the tissue level. Tissues are defined as just groups of cells that perform a specific function. So it's more than one cell. A tissue is made up of a whole bunch of cells that collect together to perform a specific function. And we're gonna learn all about tissues later. Then the next level is the organ level. We know organs in the human body, the heart, the stomach, the liver, the lungs, those are all examples of organs. And organs are defined as two or more tissues. And typically it's four or more tissues, by the way, but an organ is strictly defined as two or more tissues that are grouped together to perform a specific function or purpose. The next level is an organ system. This is two or more organs grouped together to perform a specific purpose. For example, the heart is an organ and it's an organ within the cardiovascular system, which is composed of the heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries. That's an entire system. <clears throat> Nervous tissue is there's different types of nervous tissue in the nervous system. So organs like the brain and spinal cord make up, and nerves make up the nervous system. The digestive system is crazy complicated with so many organs, I can't list them all, but things like the esophagus, the stomach, all of the sections of the small intestine, the liver, uh, the pancreas, the large intestine, those are all organs within the digestive system. So you get the message on that one. And finally, the final um, level of organization is the entire organism. In this case, it would be a human being because it's human A and B. So that's also pretty self-explanatory. If you, this is not um, an excuse or a substitute for not reading your book. This is supposed to help you when you read your book, understand it more easily. Next section in chapter one, I know I'm blowing through this really fast. It's because I need to talk, I need to slow down when we get to the more complicated um, topics in, in chapter two. But the next section in chapter one is just necessary life functions. And that's just a list, a laundry list of what we scientists um, consider necessary for anything that's alive to be considered a living organism. So I'm going to briefly list or mention that list and explain very briefly what those life functions are. The first one is a maintenance of boundaries. All that means is that all living things have some sort of a boundary that defines the external world from the internal environment of that organism. For us, it would be our skin. Second, Necessary life function is movement. All living things exhibit some sort of movement. You and I, our skeletal muscles act on our bones so that we can move all the time. But we also have movement internally. Smooth muscle largely controls internal movement in a human being. Responsiveness is next on the list. This means that all living things have some sort of an ability to respond to the environment or changes in the environment that they live in. Um, so there are environmental changes. You know that if you walk outside in January in shorts and a t-shirt, 
the changing environment from indoors to outdoors, your body has to compensate. It responds to that change. For example, you might start to shiver to produce heat. That's a responsiveness to your environment. And I'm gonna asterisk that one, responsiveness with, it's typically the nervous system that regulates and controls responsiveness to something's environment. Next on the list is digestion. All living things ingest some sort of nutrients that are outside of their body, break those nutrients down and use those to stay alive. That's the process, the breakdown technically, and the absorption of those nutrition, of those nutrients is the process of digestion. Number five is metabolism. The word metabolism, just always think of chemical reactions. So the word metabolism really, sorry, there's construction going on in my neighborhood. I'm gonna close my window. So the word metabolism, basically refers to, as a whole, refers to all of the chemical reactions that are going on inside of our bodies. That's our metabolism. There is something called cellular metabolism, which just refers to what's going on chemically, chemical reactions within, within a single cell. <clears throat> so before I leave metabolism, that typically refers to either break down something that's going on to break things down, that's catabolism, or building something, that's anabol anabolism. You've heard of, or anabolic, you've heard of anabolic steroids. Those are, steroids are just hormones um, that stimulate building like of muscle tissue, for example. Excretion, next on the list. So I'm on number six, excretion. That just refers to our bodies and all living things, by the way, need to get rid of things they can't use. We excrete not only in terms of digest, digestive excretion like feces, but also <clears throat> filtering of our fluids, urine, that's a form of excretion, and sweat um, from glands all over our body. That's also typically a form of excretion as well. Number seven, reproduction. All living things reproduce in some form or fashion. That's in order to, to perpetuate the species of that living thing. There's, there's cellular reproduction. That just refers to cells multiply in order to reproduce all the way up to organismal reproduction. And in the case of humans, um, you know that we need a male and female um, gametes or sex cells in order to reproduce. We need sperm from a male eggs from a female, that's required in order for, for the organism to reproduce. And finally, number eight is growth. All living things exhibit some form of growth, of growing from a smaller, either at the cellular level, a smaller form to a larger form. In a complex organism like the human being, we have growth at the cellular level all the way up to um, the organism itself. All right, let's move on. This is key, so I'm going to call up a whiteboard, which I will do much more often when I talk about complicated subjects. So I'm going to click on my whiteboard here and start this term. Spend a little bit of time reading about and understanding this word, homeostasis. This is the underlying theme to A and P, anatomy and physiology. The reason we say that is because homeostasis, it's by strict definition, that what that word means is keeping a stable internal environment within um, fa fairly small limits. So I'm just gonna write that. Our bodies are constantly working all day and all night to keep an internal stable environment. That's what's going on in us all the time, is the concept of homeostasis, to stay what you and I would call healthy and normal. 
and it's a, it's a constant process I'm going to put within limits. You know that it's not completely perfectly the same all the time, but if we vary too far from these preset limits, we get an, we get an upset in homeostasis. Classic example of that in human body would be when you get a fever. So if our body temperature changes just by a couple degrees, you know how you feel, um, pretty, pretty sick. So just within a few degrees variation, our homeostasis can be thrown off quite a bit. Likewise, if our body temperatures drop by a few degrees, it can be dangerous or life-threatening. So either way. So temperature regulation is just one tiny example of what goes on in order to maintain a stable internal environment. <clears throat> this word, dynamic, or this term, is really the process, dynamic equilibrium, dynamic state of equilibrium is, those are the varying conditions within the human body to try to maintain this goal of homeostasis. So homeostasis is the theme or goal of everything that's going on inside of the human body to stay healthy. <clears throat> And how we control homeostasis, how our body controls homeostasis. So I'm just going to write homeostatic control is maintained by this sort of simple, it can be complex, but it's a simple series of events. And we define homeostatic control by receptors that respond to some sort of, they sense a change, and it can be in our external or internal environment, and receptors sense a change and they send a signal to what's called a control center. And our control center then interprets the signals coming in from the receptor. So our control center interprets those signals. It knows the preset limits and the control center then sends out a response, a response signal to something called effectors and it's the effectors that actually respond to or deal with the original change that the receptor sense. That's complicated language. It's not complicated to, to really understand. Now, now I'm gonna give you some real life examples. Let's go back to the, you walk outside in February in a t-shirt and shorts, and let's say it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Receptors in your body sense the change in internal, sorry, in environmental temperature. They sense cold. Those receptors send a signal to a control center, in this case, your brain, that says, ah, it's really cold outside. And the, our body temperature is going to decrease or drop if we don't do something about it. Your control center, your brain then sends it responds to the signal sent to it by the receptors and it sends a signal or signals to effectors, in this case, muscles all over your body, and it tells them to start to contract. That's shivering. Shivering produces heat in your body and that opposes this, this cold to keep your body temperature stable. That's just one example of homeostatic control. And it's always done by a receptor sending some, a signal to a control center, which sends a signal to a, an effector or effectors in the body that deal with this original environmental change. It doesn't always have to be a change in the external environment. It can also be a change in the internal environment. 
For example, I'm going to give you a quick example of that. You eat food. If you just had breakfast, you ate some food, you drank some liquid, you swallowed it, and it goes down to your stomach. Your sens sensory receptors in your stomach sense a change of the contents in your stomach. They send a signal to your brain stem that says, ah, there's food in the stomach. Your brain stem says, well, let's do something about it. And your brain stem then sends a signal back to your stomach. And the effectors are the muscles in the wall of your stomach, causing it to start to churn and glands in your stomach to start secreting acid to digest that food. So the most common form of homeostatic control in the human body is by negative feedback. So read that section, it's short. By definition, <clears throat> this is what negative feedback is. <clears throat> the output at the effector, so I'm gonna go back to this diagram really quickly. The output here at the effector during negative feedback shuts off the original effect of the stimulus. So it opposes this original change. So in our example, shivering at the effectors opposes the cold environment and it starts to shut off these receptors because it raises your body temperature. So what I tell students with negative feedback, the key words are opposing or opposite. So during negative feedback, the output at the effector, key word here is opposes the original change detected by the sensory receptors. <clears throat> this is the most common in the human body. Your body senses a change, it does something about it, and then it shuts off <clears throat> the original stimulus in, in other words, you don't keep shivering for the rest of your life. You shiver to produce heat, and then once your body heats up enough, you stop shivering. So the, the production of heat opposes the cold, and it shuts, the mechanism shuts itself off. Positive feedback is much less common in the human body. It is a feedback mechanism, but I'm just gonna write, it's really quite rare. And this is when the output at the effector actually multiplies or enhances. Sorry about the writing on this, guys. I am on a, a, a tablet and I have to write with a plastic tip pen on a glass surface so it's not easy my handwriting usually isn't this bad um but try i'm on a vertical glass surface trying to write with a plastic pencil tip so the output at the effector enhances the original change at receptor i'm going to give you two classic examples i think your book does too of positive feedback the only two that i can think of of off the top of my head are labor contractions during childbirth. And once, once a mother starts to go into labor, the positive feedback mechanism, rather than shutting off labor contractions, it enhances them. So once it starts, it's like a snowball uh, rolling down a hill it enhances, 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 and keep, keeps getting greater and greater until the child is birthed, until the child is delivered, and then the whole system shuts down. So that's an example. Another classic example would be hemostasis. Don't get that confused with homeostasis. I know they look almost the same and sound almost the same. 
This word means blood clotting. When we start to bleed, there is an enzymatic pathway, which you'll learn about in AMP2, that stops the blood, that stops our bleeding. It clots our blood. That process is called hemostasis. That is a positive feedback mechanism that it keep, you keep clotting, you keep your, your vessel walls, keep clotting the wound in, because it's a life-saving mechanism. Only when blood stops flowing from a damaged vessel does the whole system shut down. So those are examples of feedback. Um, the last thing I'm gonna say about homeostasis before we move on is that homeostatic imbalance is best described as disease. So when we get sick, our bodies are, we have homeostatic imbalance and also aging. As we age, our immune systems don't work as well as they used to. Our regulatory systems don't work as well as they did when we were young and our homeostasis can get thrown off. Um, those are two classic examples of homeostatic, I'm gonna write imbalance, okay? Disease or sickness as well as aging. <clears throat> the last thing in chapter one, um, I'm just going through my textbook. I have the old fashioned version. If you have the digital copy, that's fine. Anatomical position and directional terms. You don't have to memorize those diagrams in your textbook. I'll just ask you one or two multiple choice questions on the first quiz about um, some of those terms, uh, maybe from table 1.1 or the diagram figure 1.7 that refers to those surface body landmarks or orientation and directional terms. So if you could read through those and know what they mean, it'll help. Things like superior, that just means toward, toward the head or above, inferior, below, anterior, as a, and as a figure is standing in front of you, facing you, anterior means front, posterior means toward the back, medial means toward the middle, lateral means away from the midline. So away from the middle. Intermediate just means between a more medial and more lateral structure, just means in between. <clears throat> Proximal means closer to the body, distal means further away, and we usually use those two terms when we're talking about comparing two terms on an appendage. For example, my elbow is proximal to my wrist because it's closer, closer to my body. But, and my wrist would be distal to my elbow because it's further away. <clears throat> Superficial means toward the surface. D deep just means the opposite, means further away from the surface. Then body planes and sections. <clears throat> I'm just finishing up chapter one. I just want you to be able to recognize sagittal, frontal, transverse, and oblique. These refer to planes going through the human body. I always tell students when I teach in person, which I prefer to do, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I, I always tell students, if you cut a human being with a machete uh, using a sword, um, you're creating a plane with that cut. And so a median or mid-sagittal plane would be if you took that machete and you sliced me right down the middle, separating me into a right and left half. That would be a median cut or mid sagittal means right in the middle. A frontal or coronal plane would be if I stood sideways to you and you cut me down this way with the machete and separated me into an anterior and posterior half or front and back. A transverse plane would be if you took that machete and you sliced a human, if you sliced me this way, separating me into a superior and inferior half. So you cut me right across my belt line that would be a transverse plane. And the word oblique always just means, really it's, it's, it's none of the above. So oblique means usually a diagonal cut. Any sort of diagonal cut is referred to as oblique. And the last section in chapter one, 
just talks about body cavities. Um, there's a dorsal body cavity, main body cavity, and a ventral body cavity within a human being. Uh, this is not difficult stuff. I'm just going to call up a whiteboard here again. If I draw a human lateral view, so this is the head, here's the neck, and the back of the person, and the front or chest goes like this. We separate body cavities, the two main body cavities, into what we call the dorsal, which encompasses everything. In, I'm going to do it in yellow because I think that's what the book uses. So this would be the dorsal body cavity I'm enclosing right now. And that basically, guess what? It includes the cranial subcavity and the spinal cavity. So the brain and spinal cord. This is, I'm, let me get my yellow pen back. And then the ventral, I think your book uses red. The ventral body cavity would be the thoracic, the abdominal, and the pelvic cavity. So everything in red is ventral, everything in yellow is dorsal. This would be a subset, the thoracic cavity, abdominal cavity, and pelvic are all in, encompassed in the ventral, and the dorsal contains the brain or cranial cavity and the spinal cord. That's referred to specifically as the vertebral cavity. So that's fairly easy. So if I asked you <clears throat> in what main body cavity does the brain exist, this is what I'm looking for. The lungs, the heart would be in the sub <clears throat> cavity of the thoracic within the ventral. The digestive organs, um, the intestines, the stomach, the liver, something like the spleen would be in this, specifically in, in the abdominal cavity of the ventral cavity. And finally, the pelvic cavity uh, contains things like the urinary bladder, um, our reproductive organs. That's a subcategory also within the ventral body cavity. Finally, the last bit of chapter one just refers to abdo, abdominal pelvic regions and quadrants. I'm not going to ask you about quadrants on the first test. I'm going to tell you that right away. Um, I might ask you one question about the nine regions.